Hello everyone, and welcome to my legendary starting guide for the High Elves. Today we'll be focusing primarily on Lothran, and especially on Tyrion, and how to show, your, show you guys some strats, strategies, and a very helpful guide in the start of your campaigns. We'll be focusing on legendary, but this, the information from this guide can help you even on lower difficulties. But on legendary, while it might, like, if you look at the screen, it says the initial challenge for this faction is actually easy. That might be true on lower difficulties, but on legendary, Lothran could be possibly one of the hardest uh, campaigns I've ever played in a Total War game. If I was going to compare this campaign, legendary campaign, to previous Total War titles, I would say it says like that, like a similar difficulty would be like playing in Shogun 2 on Legendary on Usugi. Warhammer 1 never had such a difficult Legendary campaign, and this is primarily due to the power buildup by the Dark Elves and the unstable region to the south of Lothar. We'll be focusing on how you could utilize these two beginner units to the best you can, because these two beginner units, you can carry them all the way to the finale battle. They are some of the best tools you can have. The Phoenix, the Fire Phoenix, in itself can disrupt an enemy's line, because more than likely you'll be using spearmen to hold the line. As for the uh, artillery piece, you can use that to your advantage in actually, like, uh, causing morale damage with artillery, or you just primarily focusing on AP missiles. Like, let's say if you're going up against, like, and this will happen if you reach, like, turn 200 or 300, the artillery piece and having at least maybe one or two of them can be extremely effective in taking on, like, five War Hydras or six Black Dragons. The longer you play the Legendary Campaign, the stronger and the bigger and the more difficult the stacks the Dark Bells are going to be sending to you. About turn 100, the Dark Bells were sending countless stacks. I mean, imagine a full-scale invasion of by five or more stacks at a time. Because it will not take long for the Dark Bells to, to secure the Northwestern Continent and overrun the area quickly. Eventually, if you're able to hold off the Dark Elf assaults on your uh, dwarf, the Elven Fortress, they'll be focusing their campaign southward towards Masmundi, the Lizardman. Essentially, the most common scenario is what happens is that the Northwest will be conquered by the Dark Elves, the Southwest is going to be conquered by Clan Pestilent, and if you are able to hold, you should control the northeastern continent. But the southeastern continent is a uh, a coin toss most of the time. But for my campaign, I had the worst case scenario. So, like, I had the vampire counts to really conquer. But for this campaign, we'll be focusing on the initial turns so I can help you because there is a great deal of you RNG. Hold. It is agreeable to spend one's time at first in dignified make company. a trade agreement or make a like get trade and military access with the if region you... next to you. This ally is very unreliable and unfortunately he will get overrun. Occasionally you could check the faction just north of him and see if you get a trade agreement, but that is very RNG based. The thing is what makes the uh, this campaign so difficult is because there are a couple of factions that you have to deal with and there's actually two superpowers that high elf superpowers that hate you right off the bat this ally is unfortunately unreliable and generally he gets destroyed there's an empire uh, pirate island very close and the Scalic uh, Norska tribe is to the far northeast and they'll continuously raid and actually beat your high elf uh, allies very easily so you have to secure your surrounding area very quickly of the king. before you lose what complete orders? control. Initially, build one spearman and two bowmen we have shaped this and upgrade your building. Don't worry about the level 1 barracks that you have in, in the capital. Eventually, you'll be replacing that building in the future, but not, not now. The Dark Elf army will always send this army from that small village to the south to rendezvous with its uh, capital to the northeast. This is all going according to plan, that's good. 
they've left that village defenseless, it means that you can easily take it over without any issues. Awaiting orders. Alf one. Now, the thing is, with this Alario. battle, you can auto this battle and win easily, but you're going to lose 60 uh, spearmen. Personally, I suggest I playing the battle because you can actually play this battle and suffer zero casualties in the ensuing battle. Most of the time, like, sh should you or should you not, it really depends upon you. It's going to take, since this is the beginning of the game, it will take slightly longer for your troops to replenish. So, essentially, saving every life is going to be useful because every soldier is going to be very important to have because you are going to have some big upcoming battles. You'll be defeating the Dark Elves, and then you need to be get ready for a civil war against one of the High Elf factions. Against Safri or Kalador. We'll be talking about them later. They are actually a very critical point in this starter guide. Legendary starter guide. Now, to, in order to for us not to suffer any losses whatsoever, we'll be using a mixture of using our archers, that's what we got for them early, utilizing our artillery piece, using canister shot, or what they call in this game, multi-shot, and utilizing the uh, the fire phoenix. Now, with uh, the great thing about multi-shot is that not only does it disrupt formations and cause a morale that like damage to the enemy it may not kill a lot but morale wise it's very it's a very powerful tool especially on lower difficulties but it's all for like legendary you should consider it as a very effective uh disruption tool it will cause mass panic if when you have your archers focus on the enemy's archers first not on the enemy's spearmen because what would really cause damage to your spearmen is the enemy's crossbowmen, because they're the best uh, early game anti-armor for the Dark Elves. With your Fire Phoenix, use the bombing ability to disrupt the formations and cause a massive morale drop. Once your archers deal with the enemy's archers, you could just send all focus fire on the enemy's uh, infantry units. And you should have an easy victory. In this battle, yeah, the AI was able to fire off like maybe one or two shots, so I lost maybe two soldiers, but you can get zero. That took one loss. Very, very minimal losses. That should be recovered very quickly. You're gonna have about three more bigger battles against the cult uh, against this cult, victory. so save every soldier as you can. Don't do not sack. Do not uh, destroy this. You're gonna need this province as much Champion as possible. Of the Ever Queen. Once you secure the province, you will be investing into your skills. Do not focus Ter Terian on his personal skills, rather focus on the campaign skills. Because the thing is, what you want to rush towards is getting Lightning Strike and Elven Healing, so you get faster replenishment for your forces. This is gonna be extremely critical for your early game. Now, while it might be seem useless to get wary very early on, that's going to be an extremely useful skill once the AI starts utilizing agents. If you've played the past uh, Total War game, you will you will realize of how annoying agents are when they continuously spam like three or four agents. Eventually, in the late game, the vampires will be sending agents. The dark Elf, the what's unusual is the dark elves didn't send many, but the vampires kept sending banshees to caused damage and assassinate, but they kept failing due to investing to the wary skill early on. Once you're done with the campaign skills, you'll be focusing on leadership for both uh, these two skills right here to improve your archers. Focus primarily on your archers because that is your primary DPS as the High Elves. Your spearmen are essentially there just to hold the line, but not to inflict serious casualties. Eventually, you'll be keep investing down the leadership tree to even to make your archers even more powerful combine a mixture of both archers and artillery and you have a solid early to mid game strategy eventually with the high elves you'll be you'll be able to invest into better uh, abilities monsters later on i would dedicate yourself to isha because that gives you a five percent unit replenishment 
and it, incre it lowers the upkeep cost for spears and archers, so that's hands down like probably the best the uh, god to choose your dedication to. And then you could choose any other uh, bonuses that you feel that you would like. I wouldn't suggest choosing any bonuses that give you more negative public order. The High Elves already have, in general, like a very difficult public order situation due to the fact that when they issue an edict or any or a edict of any sort, they can't get public order. They can only get growth. Alario's so, champion. that's a bit unfortunate. Go ahead and give yourself a public order building that gives a little bit of gold and a little bit of public order in your village. And make sure to produce some troops before you move on. You need to build troops every single turn because you're going to need it for the upcoming massive battles that are coming right around the corner. The AIs reinforce that town with a half a stack. The darkness. That is essentially our target. Tyrion, heir of an Once we secure that village, we will actually secure the main capital province. And then we can focus our campaign towards the northeast. We need to be very careful though. No. Because Kaldor is very, it's very close to our border and they have two Dragon Prince shock cavalry units that are very dangerous early on. We're talking like late game units at a very early stage. You can beat them, you can rush them, however you're gonna have a very... You'll be struggling your campaign per card. Ever vigilant. When you attack Kill this them. province, I would not auto. Do not auto this battle because it shows that it's like almost like a 45, 55. You are better off playing this battle. But just keep in mind, the enemy Bring does have a battle. decent number of archers. Focus on those archers and this battle will be yours. We got ourselves not a lot of spearmen, but we don't need a lot. We have more archers and that's essentially all we really need. We just need to hold a line, let our archers do their work, and then we can utilize the phoenix to basically bomb the entire line that the AI is crashing against. There's a chance that the AI might flank with their light cavalry, but it shouldn't prove that much of an issue. More than likely, you will be on this map every time you attack this town. And this little hill on the side here is a very opportunistic hill. Now, while this is not common, checking the angle, try to get in the highest point of this hill while having a good uh, sight line down is good to have. Because the thing is, more than likely, we're going to have our infantry and our archers in front of the artillery. When you have multi-shot activated, the artillery shots have a slight angle to it. You want to prevent friendly fire if you can, and keep the artillery safe because it will be very, a very useful tool in actually disrupting troop formations, and it'll be very useful in dealing with the enemy's archer units. Do not focus too much on the spears. Maybe at long range you can, but at close range, primarily focus on the uh, archers. Once you defeat the archers, the battle is essentially yours if you are playing the high elves. That's until they start getting like monsters and such. Then you have to like micromanage it differently. So we'll sword of the Asur. Multi-shot in general, I would say, is ex extremely powerful. It's also a tool I would also like strongly suggest in utilizing in the final battle. I used two Eagle Claw Ballista units, and the fact of how much damage they can call by just multi-shot and formation disruption is extremely useful. Now what I'm doing here is I'm manually controlling two archer units to attack one enemy crossbow unit. This is done on purpose, so the enemy doesn't have a chance to actually utilize their crossbowmen to do severe damage to my spearmen formation. And while those archers are going to start routing, my archers will hold the ground. Do not forget to disable skirmish mode on your archers. This can be very annoying to deal with, but uh, I would strongly disable it. And with your phoenix, 
essentially bomb the entire front line. Seeing half their army retreating and causing so much damage with your Fire Phoenix, I mean, that skill that you see that the Dark Ones are using, it's a morale boost. Focus your archers on the caster, and their morale will simply just crash. Once you're finished bombing with your Fire Phoenix, essentially have him attack the, re the enemy's rear. The Fire Phoenix causes both fear and terror. With half the army retreating, suffering casualties to bombs, and suffering heavy losses to these arrows, it will cause the enemy to rout, giving you a victory, with suffering very minimal losses. You can manually attack with your archers to get a bit more damage so you can rank up a little better. But essentially at this stage you can end the battle. But it, it entirely depends upon you. This is essentially the style that you'll be more than likely copying throughout the campaign. Essentially, but you will be upgrading your units uh, down the road, like Lothar and Seagar, Phoenix Guards be and such. You won a great victory, and effectively you'll just occupy the village. Do not do any damage to it because you want to take control the of this region. Are you can secure this region without dealing with any rebellions. Once you take over the village area, continue to build up your forces. A balance between so, archers okay. and spearmen. Primarily focus on getting a couple more archers than rather getting spearmen because that is your primary DPS in this matter. With your capital, focus on building fi your financial buildings. Destroy the level 1 barracks. You don't need a level 1 barracks in your capital because the thing is it can only go up to level 3 while your capital can go up you to level 5. Order. As for an edict, choose the uh, growth edict. It gives you plus 20 growth and it gives you a discount on buildings. Could we have issued edict and then build the buildings, the financial buildings? Yes, but the thing is that we need the uh, income and we need the public order as soon as possible for the uh, capital province. Now from here, we're going to basically lure the, the Dark Elves to us, to fight us on our terms. The Dark Elves, now if you could put, now the thing is, you could set yourself into fortif fortification stands. However, the, then the Dark Elves will not engage you, because they will, the AI knows that will be at a slight disadvantage. So well put your troops slightly what to the side, to and then get ready for an attack. Occasionally you can be lucky enough to get a trade agreement, but I wouldn't focus too much on it. The Dark Elves will see that you have a weakness here. And since you weren't in fortification stance, they'll engage you with their primary defense army that's stationed in their capital. And you'll probably be thinking, it's like, oh wait, this is bad. They have so many crossbowmen. And yes, it is definitely scary at first, but if you micromanage properly in this battle, you can come out on top and actually can you continue attacking the Dark Elves and take their territory from them. This is essentially one of the big battles, the big two I would say, right at this stage. Because after you beat this army, you'll be fighting the other High Elves. And the other, and some in Safri, in both Kalidor and Safri, both have very powerful starting armies. Due to one, ha one faction having two Dragon Princes and one faction having two swordsmen of Hoeth. But if you successfully and properly manage your archers, you can win any battle. Essentially like using, utilizing like guerrilla tactics in such a way. Now, primarily when you play the high elves, I would strongly suggest trying to find an opening that's best for your archers and artillery, so you don't have any trees disrupting your fire. Eagle Claw. I was looking for the highest vantage point I could put my artillery on, so to lessen the chances of friendly fire. Of 
And make sure to put your units into guard position and disable skirmish mode. I can't say how many times like skirmish mode can just cause more damage than good in situations like this. The enemy does have one cav unit, so light cav units, so we have to keep an eye on it and make sure to protect our flanks because it will try to go to the side and try to do some damage to us. With the enemy having so many archers, we have to respond very quickly and shooting back at them as soon as possible. Spearmen. Though we can focus and destroy some of their spear units, we have to get ready for them. I see the, cav the light cav unit flanking to my right, so I'm already repositioning some of my spearmen on my right side to get ready for that charge. But not flank anymore, they're going right in. That's perfect. The arch, the crossbowmen are getting in range, and we're gonna be, and I'm gonna be focusing two arch units per crossbow unit. And when you have your, and with your artillery, generally the crossbow units like cluster up together very nicely. That makes multi-shot from your artillery a perfect method to do double damage to one unit. Eventually, you're gonna have to prepare your fire phoenix to do its bombing run. I wouldn't worry about it too much. I would be more focused on your archers and micromanaging the crossbow. Your front line won't collapse unless you let the enemy's archers actually like pepper them to death. Once you start seeing the enemy's crossbowmen like start retreating, actually continue firing. Because on legendary difficulty, the AI have a tendency of actually coming back even though that they are they look like they're retreating. Due to the morale bonus that the AI gets on Legendary Difficulty, which is plus 8, a permanent plus 8, the AI can recover its morale, so you gotta get ready for that. Do as much damage as you can to retreating units. If you have to change your targeting, do it. When you see those purple circles around the enemy, you know that the enemy is desperate and they're about to lose. Kill the caster. That should create a good enough shift in the morale. Your arc, well, I mean, by this time you should beat the archers and then focus on the enemy's hero. And once the hero's running, everybody else is running as well. Doing as much damage to this army is also a good strategy, but in the purpose of this tutorial, we're gonna do it. Left. We're gonna move it at a slightly faster pace but in your game you could do more damage to this army because you'll be actually this army can't retreat over the uh, the, cr the river it just crossed so you can finish off this army so it can't retreat back to its uh, stronghold when you're dealing with uh, captures i would strongly not suggest ransoming captives you get a negative uh replenishment rate for five turns your best sh th option to do with the uh, tiles is to execute. Maybe get some, maybe enslave early on, so you could have a slightly higher troop number. But uh, executing is probably the best option that you will be doing throughout the campaign to get your units to elite rank nine. Now that the enemy's troops cannot retreat, they're stuck on your side, and you can actually finish them off and their capital is now defenseless. However, we have another issue. Safri is going to claim the ruins right up the north there, which unfortunately is part of the province that of the capital we're about to take. Safri is a very annoying superpower. Bring me battle. And they're a superpower due to effectively having two great sword units very early on. It is, it is very annoying, I, I will agree, but uh, they can be defeated because when an army goes into, like, colonize a ruins, they're at their the weakest stage. And that is the stage when you can attack them and their forces are very low. The RNG, it is very RNG based of the when Safri actually rested. goes for that village or not. Sometimes they go, if, they go early to it, like in this campaign. And sometimes they're a bit late, but eventually around these turns, around this stage, is when Safri's actually trying to go and try to capture the shrine for themselves. 
and this is effectively your best chance to put the pressure on the Safri faction and to take over the territory for yourself. It is a bold move on uh, legendary difficulty, but you really need more provinces to actually supply yourself an economy to support more than one army. Because if you don't attack Safri no. and you go to war with Kalidor, more than likely Kalidor is going to bring that Definitely faction, not. that blue faction up there, Safri, into the war. The and no essentially threat. you're going to be sandwiched against two powerful factions. And unfortunately, Sun the losses can result in you losing a lot of men. What just happened right here is uh, a bit of a trick against Dark Elves. They have a general that's outside the city. They have a small garrison and the city garrison, but they generally, rec after you wipe out that other army across the river, they spawn a general by himself to recruit new units. You attack that general, and you essentially force the defenders to send out their armies out into the field, giving you the advantage of defense against the Dark Elves. You don't have to lose troops in an all-out castle assault. Now, fighting, fighting a Dark Elf Lord, that must be pretty difficult. Should you use your, should you use Tyrion? against it no what we're gonna do is we're gonna prepare our army to fight against the uh the main art the main assault and as for the general we'll use armor piercing ballista rounds from our artillery to weaken the dark elf general pretty heavily as for our main army it should be more than adequately equipped to fight the dark elf defenses with your artillery, focus on armor piercing shots, and then once you do, once he gets close enough, then you can send in Tyrion to finish the job. As for the Dark Elves, when it comes to reinforcement armies, they are generally very disorganized, so you could essentially take that to your advantage. I do, I must say though, it is quite entertaining to watch Ballista's deal with uh, that unit. Essentially, I was just going at, at a quad speed. It, there was no rush. I maybe should have quad speeded a little bit too long since I can't pause it. At this, I put my wounded troops uh, spearmen behind so they don't take additional casualties and just do the same strat as I always do. Focus, have two arch units focus, one crossbow, and let the, the artillery deal with the enemy's Dark Lord. Unfortunately, since I didn't tell my archers to shoot right away at, at the crosswomen, my, my uh, spearmen took a little bit of casualties, but with this phoenix, I mean, is there anything to worry about? Not really. Tyrion is easily having, winning the battle against that Dark Elf Lord. Your archers will slaughter the enemies cross women and with the phoenix you can just completely shatter their front line and this battle is effectively yours if you do this battle battles like this on a lower difficulty oh this should be even easier the enemy morale should shatter even faster the only reason that the enemy is actually somewhat holding their line is due to the legendary buff that's essentially it your ar your archer front line should be more than adequate to deal with any troops trying to come back into the fight. Once you finish the single Dark Elf Lord, have your artillery focus on the other one. And essentially the battle is yours. The more damage you do, the less losses you're going to suffer when you auto the, uh, the castle. Could you manually take the castle? Yes, but the, the thing is, more than likely, you're going to suffer more losses to the uh, the towers on the walls rather than the enemy's army itself. So you're honestly just better off autoing the battle at this stage now that you've weakened the garrison to a point For that my queen. there's nothing they can really do. Kill them all. You'll just receive a decent amount of money, execute captives, get the experience you require. Protector of the Ever Queen. Kill them. 
There is glory to be yes. won. The gods are pleased. I'd like to also point out that that, that should be the end Shield of the, the legendary darkness. start review. The thing is, you have two strategies you can do here. You can raise the capital that you just conquered and let Safri take it. However, keep in mind, Safri is hostile towards you to the northeast. And their and they have and their home province is in a really good strategic location. Because it can't be attacked by pirates, it can't be attacked by the Norska tribes. It's in a very good strategic position. And that's also a great strategic position for you to build your economy at. Averlorn is to the north, but you can use the High Elves influence bar to actually make a faction like you. You can make Safri like you, and they can actually conquer the entire eastern island. However, you're losing a lot of money, and effectively you're forcing yourself to conquer the western side, which is, and personally for me, it's more difficult because you have to deal with the, with the elven gates, you have to deal with the Dark Elves early on, and it's generally just not worth it. If you let Safri take over the east, they can actually hold back the Skalig invasion. And the Skalig, Skalig Norska tribe is actually a huge threat in Warhammer 2. If you thought they were annoying in Warhammer 1, they are worse. Well, they're actually they're the exact same. They will send four to five or six stacks at a time, and they can essentially overrun the entire uh, Elf Order Island, High Elf Island. Time. So you have a choice. Let Safri take over the East, or you could do it manually. If you do it manually, you'll be fighting the Skaligs, but you'll be more prepared to fight the Dark Elves in later on. Because normally, before you even start bothering with the Vortex, or the uh, whole the Vortex race, I wouldn't even bother with it. Do not go for the Ritual Sites as quickly as you can on legendary difficulty. It is a, it is effectively not worth it. Focus on building your empire Greetings. and your stacks court will before you words. feel like uh, entering the uh, the ritual race. Now, if you don't care too much about the ritual race, you're effect effectively going to need to fight the other three superpowers in the final battle, which I'll be completely honest, it's not that hard. What's a lot more harder is dealing with the constant invasions on your uh, homeland. Dealing with the empires, pirates from Sartosa, the, the Skalig invasion, the vampire Son counts, the and the dark elves. Those are four factions that will be oh, constantly one. invading your shores, and you have to deal with them one by one. Here I'm showing an example of what you would do to attack Safri. Unfortunately, in this uh, example playthrough, they got there early and they're going to be in full force before I'm even trouble. able to attack them. So effectively, Champion I would more than likely restart this campaign. Now, if you're feeling bold, you can still fight Safran and take them on with them being in full force. If you utilize your archers, your spearmen effectively, you can win against them. But you will suffer some losses, I'm, I'm not going to deny what that. Orders? It is going to be a bloody Alario. battle. But if you can destroy Safri's primary army with the two great swords, well then you could take over their whole province without any issues. They're going to try desperately to regroup to fight you. But your archers should hold the ground. I do have some weak spearmen, but that should be more than enough to hold the line. The slightly stronger archers with light armor honestly doesn't even matter. When they're being shot at by two or three units of archers, that light armor really doesn't matter when it comes down to the campaign. What really comes down to this battle is those two swordsmen. Those two swordsmen can Sunburn basically make hungers. or break this battle. With your artillery piece, instead of using multi-shot to disrupt uniformations, you're going to be using armor piercing rounds and focus on one of the sword the great sword units and it should actually do some pretty serious damage then once the units come into range we do the same strats before and focusing on their archers with ours but we need to keep in mind their archers have the exact same amount of range as ours 
So they're going to be shooting our spearmen before we can be shooting their uh, archers. So it is going to be a much more difficult battle. Orders received. You could... With this battle, I could I could have gone up on that hill again, but uh, I want to give myself as much time as possible before they reach the front line because this is particularly a dangerous battle. I'm thinking, hmm, maybe I'll split my archer units, have the artillery piece, have a clean shot down the middle, and do that, and then have the spearmen. Wounded spearmen are not the best to have, but this is a battle effectively what you would do against Safri. Depending on your RNG or your luck, uh, it depends whether or not how quickly they go for the uh, the ruined island, and you can catch them off guard. But for this campaign, mm, it's a bit unfortunate. They're gonna be in full strength, but they can still be beaten. But trust me, there will be losses. We'll weaken them from a spearman, as you say. We will obey. It will be done. Without fail. Heir of Anarian. Look, our units patrol. Those uh Illyrian uh, light cab units are also a pretty dangerous combination. This generally looks like suicide for any veteran Total War player, and I agree. The um, it does look pretty grim. However, the battle still be can still be won. We have a decent number of uh, spearmen. You don't need full health spearmen to take on horsemen. But what primarily scares me are those great sword units, and the fact that we all, we have a decent amount of archers on both sides. The artillery piece was actually doing very effective. It was extremely effective against the, uh, the swordsmen of health. But as the closer they get, the more dan the bigger the danger of causing uh, friendly fire happens. Realizing that the cal that the uh, cav units are about to do a hard uh, left flank hit. I focused four spearmen units on that flank, while spreading about two spearmen units to hold the middle line. I knew for sure that's not going to hold long, but it's just for them to hold their ground. Now I got to worry about an advanced swordman unit hitting the middle, with uh, the archers being out of range. It generally looks like a pretty bad scenario, but it could still be. Remember to utilize your fire phoenix as much as you can. This is a battle you really can't miss. Even if you hit slightly on the border of the enemy, you could do some decent damage. Or morale damage. You really need to kill those archers as soon as possible. Unfortunately, since they were like shooting at max range, I had to, my archers are almost mixing with my spearmen, so it causes some mix-ups and some unnecessary casualties. What you could do to avoid like a cluster, like a I mean, in your campaign, is to right before your armies are about to both clash with each other. Move up your spearmen and archers by, I don't know, by a little bit. So your archers can be in range of their archers and not get into the uh, melee conflict. That's the, that's the one way you can actually improve this battle over what happened to me. Unfortunately, Legendary, you can't pause the battle. So you have to think on your, on your feet with every decision, every choice. The battle looks pretty tough, but since we did some damage to their archers, killed a good chunk of their light cav units, 
and now we're just essentially it's just a brawl battle between melee we can actually win this battle the uh the phoenix fear and terror attri attributes are essentially what can really change the tide of this battle unfortunately <laughs> with the legendary difficulties morale bonus these archers keep coming these wounded soldiers keep coming back into the battle effectively just not giving up. At that point, it's just better to use more to shut the cause as much uh, uh, leadership damage as possible. Effectively, if you want to rush uh, the faction Kalidor against their two dark dragon princes, this is a similar situation with you, what you would do. You would utilize maybe three or four spearmen to take on the uh, the Dragon Prince charge and then focus your artillery piece to fire armor-piercing rounds at the uh, heavy calf. While you would copy the same strat of holding the line with your spearmen and using your archers to deal significant DPS to the enemy. Now overall this campaign looks like it's doing very well. We've destroyed the main Safri army and we can now attack their main home province unchallenged. Our army has suffered some heavy losses, it is a close victory, but we can keep building more troops, we can, we can continue building more troops, we will, repl start re we will soon unlock additional replenishment once we start taking over the villages and dealing with the small remnants that are left behind, Fear the might of Alf One. and we can easily take their home province. However, do know this: whenever you declare war on Safri or Kalidor, generally these two factions are very close to each other, Protect and eventually they're going to signal the other faction to attack, a blessing. and then you have to deal with the whole situation of. Uh, Safri calls upon Kalidor, united against you, essentially. That will eventually happen, but the whole f fact about this early game is, unfortunately, RNG. Eventually, Kalidor will attack you. Eventually, Safri will attack you. To improve your odds of them not attacking you, you can use the influence, uh, the special ability for the High Elves, the influence bar, to actually like, like give the enem your enemies a nudge, like, oh, please look the other way. In my campaign, unfortunately, this one Calder declared war on me early due to Safri. But um, in my primary campaign that I beat the High Elves on, Calder was actually did declare eventually declare war on me, but they declared war on me very late. They focused their main primary army on the western side of the map. They were taking over all the regions on the western side of the map, but they essentially ignored my capital, which was maintained. very lucky. But unfortunately, with the beginning of the High Elf campaign, it is very luck-based. Could you take Kalidor instead, instead of Safri? Yes, you can. Unfortunately, like trying to conquer the western side of the island in the early game is just... It's not cost effective, essentially. If you could take Safri's territory, really you have a safe haven to build up your economy, so you can build up to get to having at least maybe two stacks or three stacks. At the very least, taking the home province of Safri will essentially effectively mean that you can support two advanced armies to help you with your campaign. And in this campaign, this legendary campaign, you need as many stacks as possible to support every front because you will be attacked on every site until you can beat back some of the invaders. The pirates of Sartosa, the Scalix, that's essentially your goal. When you're, once you beat Safri at the shrine, you essentially have to blitzkrieg into the enemy's region as soon as possible. Do not give the AI a break because this is legendary difficulty they're gonna build a stack in less than 
Oh, I don't know. Three turns? Three, four turns? You give the AI three to four turns, they'll build a... They'll have a fresh stack ready to fight you. Safri in general, both Kaldor and Safri in general, like to build words. about... Mm, a stack and a half, or two stacks. If you have to fight two stacks early game versus your one, the odds are heavily against you. You can fight it. I don't doubt that some people can. But, uh... You're better off blitzkrieging into the enemy's territory. Prevent them from regrouping. And the early game campaign will be yours. You just basically have to cross your fingers that... Diplomacy-wise, Kalidor doesn't declare war on you too early. If they declare war on you too early... Then, unfortunately, you probably won't hold the ground. By the time you start building your secondary army... It will effectively be too late. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, it, it is a bit RNG related. I could fight this battle, but no uh, mercy. honestly, I just wanted to auto it and do it quickly, and then I'm f and then I'm attacking Order the enemy's capital. Unfortunately, in this campaign, Kaldor, uh, Safri called upon Kaldor, and I was united against. Unfortunately, this campaign is this, uh, is effectively over. You can get a better start, but unfortunately it is very RNG based. It's a very, very difficult campaign. It took me about three to four tries till I had a decent start. Because what it really depends is whether or not uh, you have to deal with Kaldor or Safri in the early game. Which faction would I say they should focus more on first? Safri is, because you can use... This mountain basically prevents anything from the east crossing over, so it effectively it makes your region safe. However, Retreat. fighting Kaldor... I mean, you gain access to, like, maybe a village and a capital, but here's the really annoying thing about AI. When you start securing, like, a large province, and there's other AI at the war with the one you're attacking, especially Kaldor, the other AIs will secure the villages so to prevent you from controlling the entire province. That is a really, really annoying little, well, how should I say, Ready to serve. thing in the game. It's very annoying to deal with. If you secure Safri, you shouldn't have any AI trying to attempt to steal your territory. So... That is effectively the early game of, or the legendary start of the early game in this campaign. Next up, we'll, I'll be showing you guys off some of the mid game and late game strategies to do with the high elves. Now that we have covered the early game. The Asher are trouble. Next up, we're coming up right here is the effectively the late game. The I was able to beat the campaign only after like turn like 300 i was able to beat the vortex race and effectively it was probably one of the hardest campaigns i've ever played oh actually hold on no 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 no. this is this is a, this is a different example here's what would happen if you actually raised the dark elf capital and actually pulled your forces back to hold the western side of the island and I made an alliance, and I kept using the uh, the High Elf Influence uh, button, ruin. and essentially I made an a military. Eventually, I made a military alliance with a faction that hate hates me in the early game. Unfortunately, not securing a military alliance with them prevented me from actually taking over any of that territory. However, Safri it was is actually such a powerful faction that they were able to hold their ground very well against the Scale Lake Invaders. Even Dark Elves. But unfortunately, as I was trying to conquer the western side of the island, this High Elf faction was causing issues, and I, it just wasn't worth trying to declare war on them. I wasn't strong enough. Eventually, like, effectively in this campaign, I thought that you have to, like, actually race with the other factions to actually achieve, like, control of the Vortex. But after finding out and watching some other legendary streams, it turns out you don't have to. You can essentially just uh, 
let the other AI reach the end of the vortex, beat them in the fin in the in the fi in their final battle, which is actually very easy, and uh, just just keep building up your empire. Don't worry about uh, acquiring way shards too early. It 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 honestly doesn't matter too much. You should pro in the legendary difficulty. You should focus primarily on building up your empire and building up at least four stacks to actually give yourself a proper defense from the south continent and to the west primarily to the west because the dark elves will gaze upon your lands and they will dedicate a full-scale invasion the vortex is essentially eh, just not that important you could take your time just keep in mind the longer you take your time the harder the enemy stacks are going to get eventually when I was at turn 300, yeah, I took my sweet time. I built, I built walls around every village. I fortified with a tier five garrison building in each capital city. And even then, that wasn't even enough because at this stage, the AI is just sending ridiculous types of units. There you have the legendary victory for the high elves, but uh, at, it was at a extreme cost. I essentially gave up on my outer defenses at this stage and just like focused all my resources in the battle against the for the final battle and to hold the ground. I am in a bit of negative income, but I'm not planning to continue this campaign. Honestly, like after turn 100, the Dark Elves turn into such a superpower that it, it effectively just doesn't even make any sense to fight them. Like I'm fighting like armies that have like five war hydras or six black dragons. Oh man. If I if I wait if I wait like fifty turns more, go to around like turn like I don't know four hundred, the AI is probably gonna be sending like ten black dragons per stack. It, it just gets a little bit ridiculous once you go that super late game. So effectively I was just trying to secure a vortex victory. For the high elves. Not to mention, like dealing with the the surprise Master armies. I'm not going to spoil Hell. that, but uh, this is effectively my primary army that I would use for the end game. Phoenix, I would have Tyrion. I have a high elf wizard. Phoenix guards, a couple of them to support my. They're essentially the improved spearmen. I have Lothran Sea Guard, which are basically a mix of both uh, spearmen, shield units, two dragon princes, two artillery pieces, and the the, uh, the phoenix. Some people have asked me during the stream, why do I choose the phoenix over like a star dragon or a moon dragon? The thing is, the reason I choose a phoenix is because the star dragons or like the moon dragons, they have their uh, breath ability and they can only target one unit at a time Champion while with the queen. while with the phoenix you can quickly do a like a, <laughs> a duh, you could carpet bomb an entire front line very quickly and, and cause a massive amount of damage which is very nice to have in the late game dragon princess if you could get that as soon as possible that'd be really useful for you because once you start fighting the the dark elves they constantly have light cav or heavy cav units that will constantly try to flank you. Having Dragon Prince units will counter them. This is what happens to the campaign in about turn 300. Masmundi, the Lizardmen, they get completely overrun. Clan Pestilin gains control of the southwestern continent completely, while the Dark Elves essentially push hard from the wastelands of the north. And essentially, Mazdamundi, the, the Lizardmen, the Orange Lizardmen, they get completely sandwiched between these two superpowers, and they get completely obliterated. To the southeast, two Vampire Count factions made a, made a military alliance with each other and essentially dominated the entire continent. The last defenders you actually see here, they were actually pushed into the corner of the map, and they only had one city left. The only reason... The last defenders were even even had a chance to push out is because one they made a peace agreement 
the Vampire Counts made a peace agreement with the Last Defenders, and it gave the Last Defenders some time to breathe. Unfortunately, what happened because of that peace, the Vampire Counts sent everything towards my capital and towards my region. I was dealing with about, like, per Vampire no Count faction, five power. stacks per faction. And I had Teclas here with his one army fighting off, like, ten Vampire Count uh, stacks. What gave me the advantage? Uh, investing into replenishment as soon as possible and choosing the fights carefully. Having Lightning Strike. You thought it was important to have Lightning Strike back in Warhammer 1 Total War? In Warhammer 2? On Legendary? I don't know if you can even beat- I don't know if you can even beat this mode without Lightning Strike. Because you're gonna be fighting stack after stack after stack. Like, it's gonna be hard to even breathe My when you're playing the High Elves on Lothran. But, utilizing your capital's defenses and having your army stationed very close, my infinite knowledge you could do pretty well. Teclos' army is actually very effective. He loses about maybe 2-3 units after like a couple battles, but uh, they could be easily be replenished. Phoenix Guard units are very valuable to have. But here's a very weird thing with the current auto-resolves. With how the auto-resolves work at the moment, I would strongly suggest just getting Lothran Sea Guard. This army is just a backup army that I was able to make in one turn due to the uh, finale battle. This this leader, which has nothing but Lothred Seedguard, you're probably thinking, wow, this is an extremely ineffective army. She's actually my secondary in command. She's by far one of my best generals, and she's basically won every single battle. The only reason she has some silver units is because I, I gave my best triple elite triple gold units to my uh, faction leader for his for the final battle but she's basically won every single battle both on sea and water now I'm pretty sure it's because of her camp her leadership skills and due to her uh, campaign skills and, and eventually since your sea guard units reach tier 9 they become very powerful why the reason I why I think Lothran Sea Guard archers are so powerful is because the game assumes that they're both spearmen and archers. So it, it generally almost assumes it like a like a double stack in the in a way, I'm thinking. I sent this unit against like four dragons out at, against out, out at sea, against like a dark elf stack with four dragons, five dragons, and the, her stack essentially just easily won the auto. Took less than like maybe 50% losses in a sea battle, so hands down worth it. The bad thing about Warhammer 2 is that if you mix your army with a lot of special units, like Dragon Princes and stuff, or, or White Lions, it actually makes your army weaker and they auto-resolve. I don't know why that is, I think primarily it has something to do with units having shields and spears. And that greatly amplifies the uh, the auto resolve towards whichever side has more shields for better defense. And that's essentially that's effectively what I think that the current auto resolve is. Eventually, I expect this to be fixed, but that's just currently how it is at the moment. For campaign skills, like this is generally always, like in general with, when it comes to skills in Warhammer Total War. Focus primarily on the campaign skills that boost your army as much as it can. Focus on leadership skills next. Get the bow mastery to have your DPS as powerful as it can be. Then focus on defenses so your spearmen or any other mixture of units you plan to use later on to be strong. You'll get rally because normally rally is required to move to the next stage. Then get the next this ability to basically increase Make your gold, elite gold units even more powerful, more missile damage. You can kill Malekith, the dark, the, the uh, dark elf uh, leader, easily if you go down this combo. Your archers will be so powerful that your enemy is, will effectively not even stand a chance against you, and you can win every battle. The quest battles are almost like they'll be, can be considered a joke towards you once you have like your triple gold elite archers with these leadership bonuses. 
After you finish the leadership tree, then you can customize it to however you want. Dedicate to the goddess of Isha, and then you can effectively just upgrade your commander to be more tanky or durable. The thing is, the only thing is, you just don't want your leader to die. Use whatever bonuses that help that helps the whole spear and archer formation. Think of like a classic, um, like Greek strategy. You use phalanx troops to basically hold the line, and you have archers in the back doing the heavy DPS to annihilate the enemy that's approaching you. That's effectively the high elf playstyle, and you could carry that playstyle through on to the end game and actually defeat the campaign. But I will say this to you now if you are considering to play the high elves on legendary difficulty, they are considered one of the hardest difficulties I've ever played. It's because due to the early invasions of the uh, Dark Elves, the Skalig, and the Vampire Counts. Everlorn will be very nice. They're, they, you're gonna th you can secure an alliance with them early on, but um, you'll be focusing your campaign eastward as soon as possible. Kalidor will be annoying to deal with, but hopefully they'll be more focused on their on the high elf factions to the northwest of the island rather than focusing on you. That's just RNG luck you have to you have to be dedicated to. With your main army early on in the game, you'll eventually have to deal with the Empire at Sartosa. Now we'll say this, this is gonna be a difficult challenge because these guys are extremely annoying and they have tier three defenses in their one castle. Not to mention that they're also pretty annoying. My strategy in defeating the Empire on Legendary was to make an encampment outside of the city's reinforcement range. Eventually, the main army will leave the city, which gives you the opportunity to actually attack and secure it before they come back. Or you could force the garrison army to attack from the outside, and uh, you could do that too. Let the army attack you. Just use your phoenix bird to actually attract the enemies or mortars before they do any damage to you. In my campaign, I had the Skalix do a massive invasion. What I just did here was a quick preview of how much damage does the Skalig Norska traps do if you don't keep it under, under control. Since Safri in this campaign was eliminated early due to me, I actually had to fight back a full-scale Norska invasion, and it was pretty brutal overall. It it took me about 30 to 40 turns to secure them, and right after that, I had to deal with a Dark Elf invasion. But, <laughs> I don't want to carry this any longer as I should, because it's already pretty long. I do hope you guys enjoyed this legendary starter guide, and if you have any questions for your campaigns, High Elf campaigns, be sure to put it in the comments section below, and I'll get back to you as soon as possible. More guides are coming soon, so I'll see you guys later.